All right. So speaking of HR manuals, um, I'd like to introduce Danny Smid. She's joining us from Brown Winnet. And uh, Danny, we've worked with Brown Winnet for a really long time. Danny actually is the author of our HR manual in Iowa. And um, I've, Danny, I think I saw you present at last year's ABI conference. Absolutely. And yep. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I'm these HR hot topics webinars are my favorite. Um, but also, like you know, we've been connected with Brown Winnet for so long. So I'm really happy to finally have you here. And yeah, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Well, thank you for inviting me. And um, I agree with you. The hot topics are kind of the fun ones to to sit through and also to present. Um, you know, this morning, for example, I was making some changes as to, okay, so what really is the hot topic right now? Um, things, There's so many to choose from. Right, exactly. So things are moving quickly, um, you know, all over, both federally and state. So we will dig right in if that's okay and, and get going. Yeah, just let me know when you're done and I'll hop back on for the Q&A. Perfect. Sounds good. All right. Well, we will get started right away as we talked about um, and try to keep this within our, our time frame and leave some time for questions and answers too. Um, I'll move right through these necessary um, screens that we have. But one thing I want to talk a little bit about is some of the hot topics. We have several that I want to cover today, so we'll try to do them fairly succinctly, fairly efficiently. Um, if you do have questions, you know, feel free to, to send those in to Amy, and we can try to cover those at the end. Um, if you have questions that you think about right now that you want an answer to, let us know that too. We can, we can do that as well. Um, the hot topics that I talked about today, again, um, have been involving since I we talked about doing this, this webinar, um, but the first one that I really want to dive into is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you know, it's been a hot topic, quite honestly, probably since, um, you know, back to the COVID era, era when there were riots, et cetera, going on um, out in our world and everybody was trying to decide, okay, what do we do to, to make sure everybody understands that we're inclusive in our workforce and we want to create a, a culture of inclusive inclusivity. Um, at that point, we saw a lot of employers really start talking about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how do we incorporate incorporate that into our workplace. Um, some more advanced employers were, were trying to conquer that prior to the COVID time period, um, but really around that time frame is when it really became kind of a hot topic. Um, so let's talk about diversity and inclusion specifically. What is diversity? Well, it's what makes your, up your workplace. What is your workplace comprised of? Um, to me, diversity is much bigger than what we normally think about from a, you know, a race standpoint, ethnicity standpoint, um, even religion standpoint, things like that. It's really who we are and how we're different or unique from the individuals in the workplace that we're working with. Um, and then inclusion is how your business or your organization brings those diverse perspectives or those unique perspectives all together um, to make sure that everybody feels comfortable in the workplace and wants to work at your organization and wants to stay at your organization. So inclusion is the how. Oops, these slides were in different orders. I apologize. This is what we're talking about um, today. So just kind of a heads up. These, we're going to go through these six things. Um, and as I indicated in the beginning, there's so many hot topics right now that we certainly can't cover them all in, a, in an hour um, or, or probably in a week. Um, but, you know, to the extent that you have questions, um, even outside of, of our topics today, you know, we can talk about them at the end as well. So back to DE&I. Um, what's the importance of both? So these terms, diversity and inclusion specifically, are not interchangeable, but they build off of each other. So like we said, we hire for diversity. We bring people in with unique abilities, unique talents, unique backgrounds, um, unique educations, those types of things. And that's what makes us diverse. Um, and then we, we um, include them in our culture to really shape our culture as a culture of inclus inclusiveness. So we want people to 
um, be involved in a culture where they're, they have the ability to share their ideas. They have their ability to express their concerns or, um, you know, think about strategic advantages in different areas, things like that. If we all looked the same, thought the same, came from the same backgrounds, there would be, it, we'd be really bored at work, quite honestly, because there'd be no innovation, no strategic thought, nothing um, that would make us think outside the box and improve our organization. How do you manage diversity and inclusion? Well, you know, we look at things like statistics, you know, are we retaining our employees? You know, what does representation look like? How many different um, backgrounds do we have? What does recruitment and promotion look like? Um, as far as inclusivity, uh, we look at, are we treating everybody, you know, fairly? Are we integrating the differences that our people have, our uniqueness? Um, what does our decision-making process look like? Do our, does our leadership believe in inclusivity? Um, psychological safety, do our employees feel like they are able to, to speak up and share ideas and come to the table even though we don't all look the same or we don't all come from, from the same backgrounds? Do we trust each other? Again, even though we come from different backgrounds, is that trust there? Do we express the fact that we want to hear what you have to say? Do we belong in the workplace? Do we feel like the workplace is a place where we can go and we can share ideas and we can be included and where we have a place at the table? Employee engagement metrics. So we look at that too. So a lot of times, and we do this even in my in my law firm, we, we do a survey once a year or maybe once every other year, something like that that really asks our employees, and it's anonymous, what their thoughts are on how we're handling the e &I. How do you feel in the workplace? Do you feel like you're included? Do you feel like you have a voice? Um, how can we improve? Do you know that we have this policy or this policy that is an inclusivity policy? Things like that. Um, and that helps us really determine, okay, where do we need to go from here with our de &I program? Do we need to focus more internally and making sure that people People feel like they're included, or can we start to get out into the community um, and and tackle things that are important to our employees, and you know where they feel like we need to um, help or contribute, things like that. Some of the benefits of managing DEI, and this is important because again, when we talk about you know, the world that we live in right now, we have a labor market shortage, but on one hand, on the other hand, we have, um, you know, a lot of our, our experts talking about, is the economy going to slow down? Are we looking at a recession? What are we looking at? And so for employers to balance those two things, um, I think D and I will come into play big time because we want to be able to run our organizations as lean as we possibly can, but we want to be able to focus on new ideas, maybe think outside the box, maybe keep our employees um, that we know do a good job and that 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 feel welcome in our in our organization. Some of the benefits with DE and I include um, again the retention. It's that is huge. Increased ability to recruit a diverse talent pool. Um, you know, I can tell you with our law firm alone. <laughs> that one of the first questions that we get when we're when we're looking to recruit new lawyers is what do you guys do for DE and I? What does diversity look like at your firm? You know, and we are very, very excited and proud to say that right now, um, you know, we're more than 50% women, which is a huge, huge deal um, in the law field. Um, and we're super excited about that. And we like to tell everybody about it. So I was just gonna throw that in real quick. But um, but it definitely helps your ability to recruit a diverse talent pool um, when you as an organization are really looking at diversity and equity and inclusion. And also it helps your revenue growth. I mean, when you have a, a diverse group of employees, that diverse group of employees are going to be able to relate better to diverse customers and interact with those customers better, which are going to improve your customer pool as well um, and create or generate higher revenue. So what 
you know, again, what is the importance of DEI in the workplace? Well, to me, and this is just one person telling you, you know, my opinion, but it's the culture. DEI creates our culture in the workplace. And, you know, again, we have a world where culture has become incredibly important. And when people are out there looking for jobs, they are really looking at the culture and what your workplace or your organization can offer them from a culture standpoint. So what stands in the way of a great culture or, you know, in the way of DE and I in the workplace? Well, you know, kind of the obvious things, the stereotypes and biases, um, the prejudice and, and certainly discrimination, harassment, retaliation in the workplace when our people are acting on stereotypes or prejudices that they carry. Um, you probably have heard a lot of talk about um, microaggressions or um, implicit bias, things like that. We are human. We have to keep that in mind. But implicit biases are things where you're walking down the hallway of your organization and you see me coming towards you and you think, oh gosh, Danny's, you know, she's maybe she's late to work again today because she's got four kids at home that, you know, she's got to get to all these places and do all those things. That's an implicit bias. That's something that you assume because I'm a woman or a mother or because I have four kids at home. Um, and so, you know, these are things that we have to kind of train ourselves, especially in the workplace, to not let happen in our minds. I mean, it is it is hard. I, I assure you of that. But if we can train our minds to think, you know what, I don't really know what Danny did this morning or if she was late this morning, or maybe she had something even more serious that she had to take care of, things like that, that, you know, makes us want to learn more about that person versus assuming certain things about that person. I will pause really quickly here to see if we have any specific questions about DE&I, um, or we can, we can move on to what blends in well with, with DE&I. Looks like we've got one question in the Q&A box. It says, does, does DEI promote hiring less qualified people to achieve certain stats? And I think that that is a myth that a lot of people actually believe. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. I mean, you still want to hire your best person for the job, right? And, you know, it's an added benefit if that person is diverse. But again, quite honestly, the one thing I want to emphasize that diversity doesn't always mean race or national origin or age or, you know, those protected classes that we consistently think about. It, it really includes people from all different backgrounds, people from all different, you know, educational backgrounds, religious backgrounds, um, family backgrounds. Did you grow up on a farm or did you grow up in a city? Those types of things, because all of that is going to come together in the workplace to create new ideas, to be innovative, to, um, you know, be strategic, all those sorts of things. So, um, you're absolutely right that that is a question that I hear a lot and that um, I think organizations constantly are tackling. Um, we as a law firm, you know, decided that DEI is very, very important to us, um, but so is qualification. And so are things like coming out of law school grades and academics and, you know, things like that. And so while we still hire based on those things, we do watch to see, you know, are there diverse candidates out there that meet our qualifications? And if there are, then great, you know, let's, let's really pay attention to that. Hopefully that answered your question. It was kind of a long-winded answer. Um, let's move on to LGBTQ plus rights in the workplace. So um, I think we've been hearing again a lot in the news about LGBTQ plus um, rights, not only in the workplace, but in, in our societies as well. Um, in Iowa, particularly, there's been a lot of um, new legislation introduced and passed and um, still worked on regarding LGBTQ plus um, rights in, in our society. I'm not here today to talk to you about any specific political perspective or try to get you to vote one way or the other. That's certainly not what I want to do, but I certainly do want to um, talk a little bit about LGBTQ plus rights in the workplace. 
So just some stats on these first couple of slides, um, you know, LGBTQ plus rights have expanded through the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Bostock versus Clinton County. Most of you have probably heard of that lawsuit or maybe not specifically the name of the lawsuit, but um, the fact that it did hold that any employer who fires an individual merely for being gay or transgender violates Title VII. So this is really kind of the, the base work for, for Title VII for um, sexual orientation, um, discrimination protection, gender identity um, protection, um, gender expression. Some people um, refer to it as um, protection under Title VII. So all of those protections fall, or, fall under the um, Civil Rights Act located under Title VII. Um, and also then also file fall under our Iowa Civil Rights Act as well. Um, interestingly enough, a record 206 major corporations signed an amicus brief advocating for the Supreme Court's June decision protecting LGBTQ plus individuals from workplace discrimination. So basically, for those of you um, who don't know what an amicus brief is, it's basically a brief that anybody can submit, they have to ask permission from the court to submit it, but it's in support of one side or the other. So in this case, 206 workplaces, corporations filed briefs in favor of promoting LGBTQ plus rights in the workplace. So what are the some of the concerns? Um, according to women in the workplace, LGBTQ plus women are more up underrepresented than women generally in America's largest corporations. So we still have a underrepresented class that we're talking about. Um, also, just four openly LGBTQ plus CEOs head these corporations, only one of whom is female and none of whom is trans. So um, out of the four that are LGBTQ plus open um, CEOs, one of them is female and none of them are transgender. So again, we look back to inclusion um, if you're lacking in diversity. So we as a law firm had an individual come talk to us about LGBTQ plus rights in the workplace um, a few weeks ago. Uh, he's he is the DEI head at the Iowa State Bar Association. Some of you may be familiar with him or not, um, but he did a great job. And he related back everything that he taught us or trained us on back to inclusion in the workplace and your discussions that you have in the workplace that you really think nothing of. Like how many times a week do you talk about your children or your family in the workplace? And do you stop and think, gosh, you know, maybe my friends who are openly LGBTQ plus don't want to talk about my children because they're struggling to decide whether they're going to have children. Um, things like that, that quite honestly, you know, everyday conversations become a little bit of a, of a problem from an inclusivity standpoint. So just some more stats here that I thought um, were interesting. Compared with straight women and straight men, bisexual women are 13 and 28 percentage points, respectively, more likely to have experienced microaggressions. So again, microaggressions are similar to what we talked about with implicit biases. Those are kind of those stereotypes that we have going on in our head when we're having conversations in the workplace or we see somebody in the hallway in the workplace. Um, LGBTQ plus women are almost twice as likely to feel pressure to play along with sexual discussions, humans, or actions that they're straight women and male LGBTQ plus counterparts. So um, they, this is what I was talking about, those kind of everyday, you know, water cooler discussions. Um, you know, if, if we have LGBTQ plus employees who maybe aren't out, how do you think those conversations make them feel? We need to think, start to think about some of these things and, and make sure that our, that our conversations are inclusive um, for everybody. Half of LGBTQ plus women hear sexist comments or jokes about their gender while at work. More than half of LGBTQ plus women report having experienced sexual harassment over the course of their career. This is 1.4 times more than straight women and 1.9 times more than LGBTQ plus men. 
So where do we go with this information or these stats and what do we do? So these are my suggestions um, to you as employers. Take a look at training. Take a look about at having somebody come into your workplace and talk about LGBTQ plus and inclusivity. Um, I can tell you that the discussion that we had as a firm was incredible. And a lot of people came in and talked to me afterwards and said, you know, I had no idea, nor did I think about, you know, how many times a week I talk about my kids and how maybe that's not inclusive of everybody in the workplace. Um, so it really, really will um, help those conversations. Take a look at your internal policies and practices, you know, take a look at your applications, your hiring practices, um, ongoing work processes, and really decide, okay, are these LGBTQ plus inclusive? Um, you know, things like, does your non-discrimination policy include gender identity and or expression? Um, you know, when you have somebody fill out an application, do you ask what pronouns they use? Um, you know, are there consequences in your workplace for outing other employees who didn't want to be outed? Um, what's your dress code look like? Does it avoid gender stereotypes? Um, is it enforced consistently? Can employees dress in accordance with their gender identity? Those sorts of things are things that you need to take a look at um, in your organization to make sure that you are being inclusive. In Emphasize the importance of inclusive language in the workplace. Um, address anti-LGBTQ remarks immediately and effectively. So one of the things that, you know, I would tell you that, again, just like your anti-discrimination or your anti-harassment um, and anti-retaliation policies where you, you need to have a clear reporting process, encourage your employees and train them to come to you or come to HR, come to somebody if there's a conversation that's being, um, that, that is happening or if there's remarks being made that make those individuals feel uncomfortable. And if you get reports of these types of things, just like harassment or discrimination or anything else, um, it's all in one bucket, make sure that you're addressing it in the workplace. Okay. I'll pause here again before we move on to employee mental health and make sure everybody's still okay or if we need to talk about any questions or anything like that. It doesn't look like we have any questions on that issue. Okay. All right. Thanks, Amy. We will move but on. Everybody, to yeah, feel free if you can think of one, feel free to put it in the QA box anytime. Yep, absolutely. Um, so employee mental health, this topic. Um, like some of the ones we've talked about already, is is hugely important right now in our workplace. Um, you know, we hear on the news, we hear out in society how we have such a mental health crisis. And in my opinion, and in my practice, that is becoming more and more true every day. Um, we are seeing major mental health issues in the workplace. Um, and, you know, and employers, quite honestly, are struggling to know how to do, deal with these issues? What do we do next? What, you know, what happens if somebody comes to us and says, you know, I am having these issues, what kind of conversation can I have with them? Um, and so I think this needs to be on every employer's radar and it needs to be a priority. Um, rates of burnout, anxiety, and depression are at record levels currently. Employers are being asked to rethink how they can create a supportive work environment that includes mental health conversations or help with mental health issues, those types of things. So some of the stats that we're seeing from, from employee, <clears throat> employee mental health, nearly 50 million American adults report having a mental illness. 50% of adults with a mental illness don't receive any treatment whatsoever. Mental health costs more than cancer, diabetes, and chronic respiratory disease. $16.3 trillion is the estimate, estimated economic output loss due to mental health from 2011 through to 2030. Globally, one in seven adolescents between the ages of 19, or 10 and 19 years old are dealing with a mental health condition. I mean, these stats are scary, guys. They really, really are. And it's easy, I know, for us as employers to kind of sit in our organization and think, 
you know, these are horrifying stats, yes, but they're not going to affect us. We're, you know, somehow immune for them from them. Well, I can tell you you're not. And I can tell you that I get calls every day from employers who want to talk about how do they address, address mental health concerns in their workplace. And, and quite honestly, as a law firm in the metro area, we've dealt with mental health concerns and we have um, started a mental health initiative where we are communicating openly um, with our employees, lawyers, staff, everybody about resources that we have available to be able to help them. Um, and so it is it is a hot topic. It's one that has to be discussed and one that has to openly be discussed. So just some things as employers to consider. If you have a traditional EAP in place, employee assistance program, make sure it's meeting employees' mental health needs. So, you know, check in with that e EAP and make sure that it has what your employees are looking for, that it has the resources to help them with any mental health concerns that they have. Um, we all have heard and we all know that healthcare, mental health um, practitioners are hard to get into. They're overwhelmed, um, you know, so make sure that your EAP has the right resources to help your employees. Start and encourage conversations about mental health. This will help reduce stigma and boost employee well-being. Personal journey discussions. So again, super important. If you have, you know, maybe it's an annual meeting or it's a quarterly meeting or, you know, whatever that looks like, if you have the ability to, you know, have somebody in your workplace speak up about maybe their personal journey, if they're willing to do so with mental health, um, I will tell you guys, it's amazing how much that opens the door to further conversations. And it really gives you as an employer an idea of, okay, what do my employees need from me right now? What can I provide to them that might help um, their, their mental health concerns? Provide mental health training. Incorporate mental health education into leadership training and provide training for employees as well. Learn to recognize warning signs. So this is hugely important as well because what I won't what I won't do and what I don't want you to do as employers is put yourself in the position of a mental health practitioner because you're not. Um, maybe some of you are if you truly are a licensed mental health practitioner, but um, for the most part, we don't want to put ourselves in that situation to try to decide or determine whether somebody has um, something going on with their mental health. But at the same time, or maybe the flip side, we need to be able to look at the warning signs and, and really be cognizant of what's going on with our employees. And things like, okay, maybe maybe Danny is, is acting differently today than she has, you know, for the past few months. Maybe something's up, or maybe for the past month, you know, she's really just not engaged in her work. She's not showing up for meetings. She's not, um, you know, actively participating in, in X, Y, Z. These are signs that maybe it's time to have a conversation about, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? Is there anything I can do to help um, type of things? Incorporate aspects of mental health into the workplace. Have check-ins with the workforce or by department, wellness practices, pulse surveys, follow up on any issues that are raised. So again, you know, a lot of us instituted wellness programs way back in the day where those were popular too. So make mental health a part of your wellness program. Make sure that your employees have the resources that they need to, to make sure that their mental health stays on track. Um, communicate with employees regularly about mental health benefits and resources that are avail available to them. So one of the things we've been doing as part of our initiative is just sending out weekly reminders about, okay, remi remember we have an EAP in place and you can call the EAP for any reason and they will refer you or help you decide, you know, what help you need. Um, reminder that we have, now we have a um, wellness room, I think is what we call it, um, where any of our employees can go and and sit in there, do what they want. And it's it's actually a really cool room. And just take a break, just take a mental break from, you know, whatever is causing you concerns in your mind at the time. Like just sit and, and relax, do something that you like to do for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever the case may be. Um, but this is, you know, a room for the employees really just to kind of relax and take control again of, of what's going on in their day. Um, but 
communication is huge, guys. And if you um, can make your organization understand that there shouldn't be stereotypes related to mental health concerns, that it is a real thing. And it's it's a real thing that a lot of our coworkers and our employees and our friends and our family um, members are going through. Those conversations need to take place. And again, you know, training for your employees that if they're seeing something that seems off, off or recognizing things with employees that doesn't seem quite right, report those concerns so that you as an employer can help um, get employees through these situations. So what impact does mental health have in the workplace? Um, loss of productivity, absenteeism, high turnover, and decrease in revenue profitability, um, and increase in litigation. Um, one of the things, and, and I don't really want to make this purely legal, but one of the things that, that we're seeing as well um, is that mental health illnesses, um, anxiety, depression, all those sorts of things um, are generally going to be considered disabilities under the ADA. So if we are dealing with employees who have mental health concerns in the workplace, will want to um, think about that ADA analysis, um, you know, that interactive process that is something like, hey, you know, things seem to be a little bit off, you know, can you tell me what's going on? Is there some way that I can help you perform the essential functions of your job? It doesn't have to be that formal or static, but conversations like that to, to make sure that our, that our employees are able to get through their work days. So, Interesting jump here, but from mental health to workplace violence. And, and sadly, sometimes this does go hand in ha hand. Um, but workplace vi violence, again, as we hear in the news and on the social media sites and everything else is, um, is increasing over time. Um, each year, an average of nearly 2 million U.S. workers report having been a victim of violence at work. A 2022 SHRM survey of U.S. workers found that 28% of workers have either witnessed aggressive interactions between coworkers and or have actually been involved in them personally. These are scary stats, guys. I mean, I hear, I also get a lot of calls from employers that say things like, how do we protect ourselves if, you know, somebody gets violent in the workplace or aggressive in the workplace? And um, so, again, it is a, a current hot topic. Um, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health defines workplace violence as the act or threat of violence ranging from verbal abuse to physical assaults directed towards people at work or on duty. So we see a lot of employers who, who kind of combined the concern for workplace violence with the concern for um, illegal harassment in the workplace, as well as the concern for bullying in the workplace. Um, workplace violence may also include acts that result in damages to an organization's resources or capabilities. So what do we look at as far as ways to, to prevent workplace violence in your organization? You know, this, like everything else, is not something that we can completely predict, but it certainly is something that we can try to prepare for the best that we can. Um, one of the th first things we should do is conduct a risk, risk assessment. Um, you know, take a look at your workforce, take a look at, um, you know, where you're located geographically, what you're close to, what type of work your employees perform, and really decide, okay, what are some of the specific types of violence that are most likely to occur in our workplace? Um, establish clear responsibilities and communication channels. Again, ensure that your employees know who to turn to if something doesn't seem quite right, or if they're seeing maybe a couple employees go at it in the workplace and it's starting to get heated and uh, people get concerns, or if they see somebody who maybe seems off or maybe has discussed things like suicide or mental health problems or things like that, um, these all need to be reported so that they can be on an employer's radar to make sure that nothing escalates or nothing gets goes further. Again, provide employee training and support. If you see a situation like this, what do you do? What types of situations you know, do you look for? What do you need to watch out for? 
implement and install surveys, surveillance systems, panic buttons, security technology, all those things. Um, again, I'll tell you that we've been doing this process here at my law firm as well. And our receptionist um, now is what we call lockdown. So nobody can access our, our workspace or our floors um, without us going down to the first floor and, and grabbing them and bringing them up. Um, but we also have equipped our receptionist um, who sits on one floor only with a panic button. And so if she sees something that's happening in front of her or coming towards her or whatever, she has a button that will alert others of us in the firm and we can immediately then call the police and get them involved or, you know, do what we need to do. But it goes directly to a couple of us in the workplace. Implement effective lockdown procedures. So we hear a lot about lockdown in the schools, right? You, they do a lot of lockdown training. Um, I would encourage you as an organization to do the same. If there's something that's going on, if somebody seems to be um, getting hostile or violent or volatile or even aggressive, you know, can we send out a note that says, hey, guys, stay in your, your workspaces, don't leave your workspaces or, you know, something like that so that employees know um, where to go or what to do in the event that something is happening in the workplace. Again, offer mental health awareness training for employees, you know, back to what we were talking about before. Recognize risky situations. Are we terminating an employee today who's not going to be happy that they're being terminated? Where are we doing that termination? Um, is it in a conference room close to the door? Is it in the middle of our workspace? Can we do it somewhere more, dis more discreet so that if something does happen, we can get that employee out, out of the doors right away? Do we need to notify security um, that this is happening? Those types of things. Um, and again, importantly, communication. Encourage your employees to report something immediately before it escalates into something that maybe we're not equipped to handle. I want to give you just a quick and dirty example of, of a situation that happened here in, in um, our law firm a couple of weeks ago. We One of our employees... Um, sent out a cease and desist letter asking a former employee of a of a um, client to stop basically stop sending nasty grants to the employer former employer. Um, as soon as this associate sent that letter, she sent it through um, her legal assistant, who happens to be my same legal assistant, um, via email. And as soon as that former employee received that letter, that individual started sending threats back to the associate and the legal assistant in our office. They were all done via email, but they were threats, like real threats, scary threats. Um, when they came to me and told me this, we immediately, I got together with our, our COO and we called the, the Des Moines Police Department and they sent somebody over um, immediately to look into what was going on. So you know, it's it's a plan that we have in place. It's something that we needed to do. These threats were real. They were scary. They they bothered everybody. Um, and we brought the police in immediately. So I guess what I'm telling you is that helped two things. Number one, we knew that this was outside of our comfort zone. So we needed to bring the professionals in. So we called the police. We got them there immediately. Um, two, by doing so, we also showed our employees that, look, guys, we take this stuff seriously. We have no intention of putting anybody in this workplace at risk. And we're going to take every step we can um, to make sure our employees, who, as we know, are our most valuable assets, are going to be protected. Um, so when you um, are thinking through these assessments and, and putting policies and procedures in place. Make sure that you're communicating them and letting your employees know that this, this stuff is real. This is stuff we take seriously. We're not just going to sit by and let something in the workplace happen. So that was a lot between the mental health and, and the workplace and violence. So again, I, I will pause to see if we have any questions. Um, and if not, again, we can we can do questions and answers at the end as well. Um, I think I want to address the two questions that are in the Q and A box at the end. But I did just get a um, 
a quick question submitted that says, do you recommend terminating, do you ever recommend terminating employees over Zoom? And if so, what are the consequences of that or what to look out for with, with that? Um, I do. We've done it. Um, that was not unusual in the COVID stage. Um, you know, I do sometimes tell employers if we have a potential um, situation where the employee who's being terminated could get aggressive, could get argumentative, could get um, violent or volatile, um, then absolutely do it over Zoom or do it over even the phone. I mean, don't don't put your organization at, you know, more at risk by making that individual come back into the workplace, especially if they're already upset or you know they're going to be upset. Um, the consequences, quite honestly, legally, there's not much. I mean, you're still communicating the same thing. Um, you, you'll you want to make sure that you're still going through the same checklist, that you're telling them that, yes, you're not allowed to come back into the office or the workplace. We will send you or get you your personal belongings, that type of thing. Um, but I would a hundred times rather do it that way than create a risk for your organization if a person's going to somehow act out. Yeah, and I would even recommend that you can record it if you need to. Mm -hmm. that's, Absolutely. That's the nice thing about having it yeah. over technology. Absolutely. Great. Okay, thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, okay, so it's 1245. We're going to conquer religious accommodation quick because I also think this is important um, in light of a, a new U.S. Supreme Court decision that came down about a month ago. Um, so probably most of you didn't worry a whole lot about religious accommodations until COVID struck. And then we heard a lot about it because, you know, a lot of people were, were requesting religious accommodations to um, so that they didn't have to give, get the, the vaccination or do various things, maybe wear masks or something like that, because they believed it was against their, their really religious beliefs, practices, um, or observances. So recently, about a month ago, the U.S. Supreme Court came down with a new decision that specifically talked about religious accommodations and really what that test is as to um, whether you need to provide them or not. So um, the gist of it is, is the ruling does did make it harder for employers to deny requests for accommodation for their religious beliefs, observances, or practices um, that, that may conflict with an employ employment requirement. So just the very basic legal framework. So Title VII of the Civil Rights Act requires employers to prohibit discrimination based on religion um, and to really reasonably accommodate um, an employee's sincerely held religious, ethical, and moral beliefs or practices, unless doing so would create an undue hardship on the employer. So, you know, we've heard about, we know a lot about disability accommodations. This is religious accommodations. It's still the same. You need to do it if it's reasonable and does not create an undue hardship. So the Supreme Court case um, came into play and just made that a little bit more difficult for employers. Um, it involved a former postal worker who sued the U.S. Postal Service for failing to accommodate his religious practice, which is um, that of an evangelical Christian um, who observes Sunday Sabbath, meaning he doesn't he doesn't go to work on Sundays. The Postal Service scheduled him for some Sundays, some shifts during some Sundays involving Amazon deliveries. So he sued saying that, you know, the employer, the U.S. Postal Service refused to accommodate his request for Sunday Sabbath. Um, and the employer, the U.S. Postal Service said, no, that's an undue hardship for us to accommodate that. Um, and so you need to come to work on Sundays. The Supreme Court said employers can only deny an employee's request for a religious accommodation under federal law, if they can prove it would result in substantially increased costs to the business. So they're kind of setting this threshold or this test for, you know, as to whether something is an undue hardship or not. It stated, the court stated that companies must evaluate the practical impact of an accommodation on the conduct of the business based on the nature, size, and operating costs of that particular organization. So what's the impact? So the court definitely heightened the standard for religious accommodation in the workforce. They didn't take it all the way up to the standard for disability accommodation, but we're somewhere, we're, we're borderline there. 
Um, the undue hardship burden analysis will be highly fact specific and depends on the specific situation on a case by case basis. So basically what this says is employers can no longer deny accommodations that impose more than a de minimis burden. So for example, the US Postal Service can't say, no, it's an undue hardship for me to allow or for us to allow an employee to stay home on Sundays because you know we'd have to hire more people or something like that. It's a much higher standard than that. Now they have to show what that cost would actually be. So what should employers do now? Well, my best advice to you, and again, this is a very, very recent case that may get changed, you know, by who knows, by legislation, by additional cases that come down, um, you know, so it's kind of an ongoing burden that we're going to have to pay attention to. Um, but definitely take a look at revise, or if you don't have a religious accommodation policy, think about having one. Um, that basically says that, you know, we're going to determine accommodations based on our interactive process on a fact specific analysis on a case by case basis, and we will look at costs and business specifics when we're taking or when we're determining determining what is an undue burden or hardship at the time. That was really quick with religious accommodation too. Um, and I do wanna get into non-competes, totally different subject real quick. We'll fly through them and then we'll talk through <laughs> any questions that, that um, anybody has. But importantly, the Federal, Federal Trade Commission, the FTC um, put out a notice of proposed rulemaking back in January that talked about um, banning non-compete classes nationwide, essentially. Um, there was a public review period that ended in April, and we're still kind of waiting to see what happens. But the FTC has said, you know, we're going to, it's going to take us forever to get through most of these, these comments that we have, these public comments. So it's probably going to be 2024 before anything actually comes out with the new rule. Um, but Basically, what the new rule said is that it's banning non-competes generally. Um, existing non-competes would have to be rescinded. Employers will be required to provide notice to former and current employees that are impacted by the change in law. So if you have non-compete agreements out there and this new rule goes into place, you've got to tell your employees or your former employees that that non-compete agreement is rescinded. It doesn't, the rule doesn't necessarily prohibit non-solicitation or non-disclosure provisions. Those can still be used, but the FTC has said that the, the title of the prohibition is not determinative. So if it's a non-solicitation or non-disclosure um, that looks an awful lot like a non-compete and acts a lot like a non-compete, it's going to be considered a non-compete and it will be void. The rule states that it would that it would supersede any state law statute. So this is important because, you know, before you would look at, okay, where's my employee located? What, what law or what state law governs this employment agreement or this restrictive covenant agreement? For example, Iowa has always upheld non-competes so long as they are reasonable. Um, well, Iowa law is not going to matter anymore if the FTC gets this rule passed. It is going to be a general um, ban of non-competes. It applies to both employees and independent contractors, but it does exclude non-competes for the sale of business. So if you are acquiring or selling a business um, and there's a non-compete involved in that sale, those will still be upheld. So in addition to the FTC, many states are looking to ban non-competes. In fact, Iowa has had this past legislative session had multiple proposed legislation dealing with non-competes too. So it's clearly on Iowa's radar as well. Um, but so far, California, Minnesota, North Dakota, and Oklahoma have banned non-competes entirely. Can't have them. Anyone's entered into previously are rescinded. Same old, same old. Um, other states have been looking at non-competes and have enacted restrictions that set kind of a compensation thres threshold um, or require advance notice. A lot of the, the new laws are targeting non-compete agreements that apply to low-wage workers. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about a compensation threshold. So the courts are really wanting to 
look at whether a non-compete is going to help protect your business. So if you're having employees who, for example, are um, you know, factory workers that really don't have any sort of specialty knowledge or anything like that, um, who aren't going to be able to really go out and, and hurt your business, um, those, those aren't going to fly. They're no longer going to fly. Um, so they really are looking at probably what I would consider upper, upper level specialty position type agreements. So what, is you, what do you as an employer do? Well, we're still sitting in limbo. limbo. We don't know what the FTC final rule is going to look like. Um, and so I would encourage you to stay up to date on the state laws, also um, on the, the proposed FTC rule. Re review your current agreements to see if you're using them in a way that is going to protect your business and that you can you know, say to a court, yes, this helps protect my business and this is why. Be thought thoughtful about choice of law provisions. So when you have restrictive covenant agreements or employment agreements with restrictive covenants in them, um, do you state in that agreement that it is governed by the, the laws of Iowa? Or do you, you know, if you have remote employees, do you have it governed by the laws of that employees where that employee is located, that type of thing? So take a look at those. Um, and maybe compare them to, to what states are, are still supporting non-competes. Um, and definitely start planning for alternatives to non-competes. You know, if they are banned, do what does your non-disclosures and your non-solicitations look like? Um, and do those need to be re revised in a way that's still going to help protect your business? So lastly, oops, social media. I stuck this in there because social media is always a hot topic. And this just talks about some of the pros in using social media with your business, um, a lot of which revolve around marketing and branding and those types of things. Um, but you want to be careful because you certainly don't want you or your employees to use social media um, by accidentally exposing confidential or intentionally exposing confidential information. Um, <clears throat> if employees are allowed to use social media during the work time, um, you know, is it, does it cause a decrease in productivity? Um, you know, make sure that employees aren't using social media to harass other coworkers or other individuals on social media. Um, and, you know, again, the main thing with social media is your reputation and does social media have negative exposure um, in regards to, the, to your organization? So some quick and dirty guidelines. Have a, a formal social media policy that says all these things. Don't disclose our confidential information. Um, don't harass other employees. Make sure you're following all our other policies and procedures while you're utilizing social media. Um, have some social media training. Make it clear to employees what is considered confidential information and what they shouldn't be disclosing. Um, and, and align your branding and company-related posts. All right, we made it. Amy, I'm going to let you you navigate the questions. <laughs> yes. Okay. Awesome. That was a lot. It was I'm a just, lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to stick the um, credit codes here in the chat so you guys have those, and also Danny's contact information and like all that good stuff. Okay. So the first question we have is when we have someone express work-related mental health concerns, this is not approved by our work comp carrier. Do you see this changing? I would love for our employees to get the help they need. Um, so you're right. A lot of work comp carriers aren't going to cover mental health. Um, I do think that that will start to change. I do think that if, you know, it's going to be kind of the same um, threshold with other injuries. You know, if you can show that your mental health deteriorate, deteriorated, that's really hard to say, um, <laughs> due to your work or, yeah, or as a result of, of your work, then I, I truly think that um, they're not going to have a choice but to start to cover some of these things. Um, but I completely agree with you. You know, we want to get our employees the help they need. Um, I will also look at, into EAPs or just building maybe resource files, those types of things, um, whether it's electronic or, you know, in paper form, a drawer or something that 
that gives suggestions as to resources that our employees can explore. Hmm. Yeah, I think that that's related to the next one. It's not a question, but a helpful suggestion from somebody in the audience that says, our company offers an EAP, Employee Assistance Plan, aligned with the department through our local hospital. The employee can discuss anything confidentially with the people in this EAP, a really good, effective employee benefit. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That is interesting. And that is a great benefit. And so I do think it's important just to build on that, that we start to think outside the box for some of these resources that we can get to our employees. Because again, I mean, we all know that our, our mental health providers are, I mean, they're swamped, they're busy, they're a lot are taking new patients, those types of things. So it's sometimes a long wait to even be able to get into with somebody. So if you can come up with other ways, you know, that might be impactful to our employees to, to help their mental health. Um, absolutely. Those are great things to explore. Yeah. And I would also say, I know that a lot of people are struggling to find um, doctors and counselors and stuff. It's also really important, I think, to not put that burden on the people that we work with um, right. and the people that we, you know, work for and stuff. I, I know that consent is not always given when or even asked for when we're talking about really really like traumatic stuff or really hard topics and somebody might not be in the headspace to receive that information I know that you know an employee or a, um, a colleague and I were talking about that the other day can you add some suggestions about that talking to your employees about that um, you know, again, I would just encourage open dialogue and I would, you know, if you're going to have conversations that maybe somebody isn't ready or prepared to have, you know, come at it very gently. That's, that's a non-legal term, but, you know, I think it's, is everything okay? Is there anything we want to talk, you want to talk about? And, and if somebody isn't in that headspace yet, then give them some space, give them some time. Um, but try to keep that, that communication open if you can, and maybe Make sure that you're, you know, you're kind of observing and making sure that that employee stays okay, um, especially until they're ready to talk or ready to open up or, you know, maybe ask for some help or some accommodation or something like that. I can imagine that that gets even more difficult when you have employees working remotely for the most part, or even some of the time, because you don't you can't keep tabs, not tabs, but you know, you're not around them. You're not communicating as much with them. You're not seeing them in person as much. So maybe even extra check-ins for Absolutely. your remote workers. Yep. Check-ins, those, you know, wellness pulse thing, you know, just, just making sure, even if it's via electronics or, you know, whatnot, that, Hey, how are you doing? Everything? Okay. You know, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to be super pointed questions. Just, you know, how's, how's your week going? How are things going? What's going on in your world? You know, and they're going to want to share as much as they want to share. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, this was so great, Danny. Thank you so much for joining us today. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, Danny's uh, contact information is in the chat. I will also include it in the follow-up email that goes out tomorrow. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks again, Danny. Absolutely. Thank you guys. <laughs> Bye-bye.